mean, I should just talk about nothing. Because that's bullshit. Like, who wants to see that? So that's kind of where I sit on this stuff. And, and I have so much to do. I don't really know what to cover. Like, should I go into some of these things I'm talking about? And I'm studying? Should I get some of these books? Should I talk about... Let's read the chapter of this book here. A historical and critical view of the speculative philosophy of Europe in the 19th century. Should I read this now with you and say, hey, what is philosophy to those people at that time in history? And what am I going to do within the book? I don't know. You know, like, that's a... I don't know, like, is that something that someone would even watch? Barely anyone watches the important videos, let alone shit like this. Okay, we'll do that, I guess. Motherfucker! So I'm gonna do a little bit of a reading. This book... is a little fragile. More than I realized before I got it. And it's called... Historical and Critical View of the Speculative Philosophy of Europe in the 19th Century by J.D. Morrell, A.M., whatever that means. And the idea behind this is I, um, I look to study what the philosophy was in this era to kind of get the mindset of how it's going to kind of work in the book. I know I said 19th century, but our book is kind of philosophically approaching that era. So I figure, well, why not just get into the mindset of that? So let's begin. Everything that is brought into existence must have a final cause. The final cause of man's intellectual faculties is to know. And the material of knowledge is truth. The search after truth, therefore, is the natural sphere of our mental activity and philosophy, which is the name we give to this process when it is carried on with intelligence and design, is at once a real want <clears throat> and a necessary, well, a necessary product of the human mind to understand what is around us. The process of knowing, however, is a very gradual one. The infant mind appears first to exist in a state of bare receptivity. The first intellectual impulse that manifests itself is simply the desire to, of receiving impressions, which pour in upon it from every side, with the greatest possible intensity. As the mind develops, these impressions are remembered, compared, and classified. So that on our emerging from the cloud of our infancy, we find that we have been spontaneously active in gaining an extensive acquaintance with the phenomena of what we term the external world. This spontaneous activity, therefore, we find has even thus early given us a practical knowledge of outward things and many other relations which they hold to ourselves and to each other. And the result of advancing years and continued experience is, in ordinary cases, simply to afford us the means of a wider observation, of a more extensive comparison, and of a more complete classification of them. This knowledge of phenomena, of things, that, of things as they seem, is sufficient for all the practical wants of human life. And the mass of mankind are content to confine their observations to them alone, without any injury respecting their real nature, the mode of their subsidence, or the medium by which the mind perceives them. The life of men, therefore, who are thus conversant about phenomena only, we term spontaneous. Their mind, stimulated by the external world, exercises its faculties without being reflectively conscious of a single mental operation. The impressions and ideas exist, but it is never asked how or why they exist. Mental operations are carried on, but it is never surmised in what manner they are carried on. Knowledge is gained, but no inquiry is raised about the grounds or certainty of it. 
So in a word, goes forth, but it never returns to render account of itself, or to inquire how it has been produced, or how far is it of any value, as being an accurate reflection of the truth of things as they are. They're just basically like, fucking people just do and do, and they don't really think like, why do I do what I do? That is the basis of like, kind of how I understand my life, right? I, I study intel like intensely. Why is it I'm doing these things? What leads me to these courses? You could look at it in, in terms of um, like what, like st stressors and traumas that kind of shaped your mind into ways to protect yourself when it comes to like traumatic incidences and, and how you go about things in a stressful situation, um, like childhood traumas, I should say. You could look at it in aspects of that, but also in aspects of how you gain the knowledge going forth. and and what it is that you do to seek and to create a better version of yourself daily. Outside of the traumas, you could look at it in terms of, like for instance, I constantly am striving with the knowledge of what words really hold. Now this is a new phenomenon in my life, but I'm thinking a lot about what exactly are these words, these collection of words. And it's interesting how they can trigger ideas of the mind. So words are merely something that we created, but upon that creation, it's something that we use to decipher the, the fucking mind that we have. It is an, it's, an, it's fucking crazy. If you really think about it, like language and words is the most strangest fucking thing because your mind doesn't know English. It's not like, and my mind just knows English and that's how it talks. Like, it doesn't do that at all. It's happening here and there's somehow something going on in your head that you can say out what your mind is. I don't know, man. Like, you don't think that's fucking crazy? That's fucking crazy. That we're able to... I don't even know how to say this because I don't know... I don't know the full spectrum of it. But it's just, to me, it's so strange that I have a mind that thinks and I am able to put a language to those thoughts. And it becomes decipherable enough for you to hear me and understand the words I'm saying. Maybe not the substance that I speak of, but at least the words make sense. I mean, that's crazy, is it not? I mean, intellectually understanding ideas from someone else's mind, you know? I mean, take away from that not only those aspects, but also aspects of, like, how language shapes and changes and root languages and this, that. Oh, it's fucking crazy, man. And that's like a thing, like some people just don't think about that. They just do the root things. Like this is saying, like there's people out there that do that. Whilst, however, the spontaneous life has ever been that the mass of mankind, there always have been minds that could not contend themselves with knowing only the world of outward phenomena. Their mental activity, having first gone forth to grasp the variety, varied forms of the outward world, returned back when it had accomplished this purpose, to inquire how the process had been managed, what were the powers of the mind employed, and what confidence there is to be placed in the result. This process is what properly termed reflection, and the reflective life accordingly is that which attempts to render a true account of the spontaneous life of man. Shut the fuck up. The first man that reflected was the first speculative philosopher. The first time that ever th thought returned to inquire into itself and arrest its own trains, whatever that means, was the commencement of intellectual philosophy. And once commenced, it was inevitable that philosophy should continue as long as a problem was left in the mental or moral world to be solved. Again, it's just saying like thinking about why you do and what you do. The primary efforts of reason to get at the ground principles of human knowledge were naturally weak and imperfect, but as reflection progressed, the path became clear, until some one individual of more than ordinary reflective power arrived, and he considered at a solution of the main problem of human life, and sent it forth as such into the world. This was the first system of philosophy. And as a successive attempt to do the same thing 
have differed in respects to their principles, their methods, their extent, and their results. So they have given rise to the different systems of philosophy, which have been thrown up to the light of day by the ever-flowing tide of human thought and the ever-restless striving of the human reason. It's weird how to say of the human reason instead of of human reason. I don't know. Philosophy had been variously defined. By some it is termed the science of the absolute and universal. By others, it is viewed as which is to explain the principles and causes of all things. Whilst others, again, denominate it that branch of human knowledge which is conversant with abstract and necessary truth. All these definitions and many others which might be mentioned amount, in fact, very nearly to the same thing. It is... Well, if it were necessary to make an idea of philosophy still clearer, perhaps you might say that it is the science of realities in opposition to that mere appearance. The attempt to comprehend things as they are, rather than as they seem, starting originally from phenomena, internal and external, it seeks to discover what reality there is beneath them. What is the law of their development, and what is the ground of their existence? Thus, if it, it's so weird how some of these words are, I don't know. Thus, if it treat of the subjective world, the inquiries into the, nat the nature and validity of our faculties, into the true confoundation of knowledge and faith. If, on the other hand, it treat of the objective world, it strives to look through the outward appearance of things and comprehend the essence by which they are upheld. Having done this, it next seeks to determine the connection with an X that subsides between subject and object, and the common origin from which they both proceed. In carrying on this process of inquiry, the human mind can never content itself with the superstructure of knowledge, which is either uncertain in its foundations or imperfect in any of its parts. Accordingly, the philosophic spirit, when once begun, ever strives at the perfected system in which every phenomenon within or around it shall be accounted for. In every problem analyzed and solved, the history of the continued progress of this attempt to unfold abstract and fundamental truth. In the history of philosophy, the different systems are but different movements of the whole process and the united sum of such truth which now exists in the world is the fruit of philosophy up to the present time. That's a fucking... I wouldn't even say mouthful. It was more of like a mindful. It's really... It's intense, is it not? But it seeks out the, 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 the problems. Why is this? And it fundamentally puts group things in groups and tries to seek out what it exactly is the reason behind blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing. At least that's how I'm understanding it. Now, many people look at it differently, but like for instance, a lot of this makes sense to me, but I wouldn't cons consider myself a philosopher. But according to this, in the 19th century, yes, I guess I would be. But now, I'll be honest with you, when it comes to looking at things philosophically, I just feel stupid. I really do like this shit humbles me like god damn I'm I'm dumb I don't know what the fuck's going on this doesn't make sense I don't understand everyone's more intelligent than me it like humbles me it brings me so down the peg of reality but what I seek to do with this book here and maybe I can read a little bit more I'll read another section how long is it oh it's ungodly long holy mother of christmas kringle are you kidding me 65 pages in we're still going through the fucking introduction oh lord have mercy 60 70 okay by page 72 the introduction will be done we're on page five <laughs> it's just introducing us to the idea of philosophy and that makes sense that would be something that someone of this mind would do like i, I need like 80 pages to tell you about it what it might be so I will read a little bit more 
and then we can kind of pause from that point and reflect and then that'll be apparently this will be a fucking series that I'll do I guess I guess I won't have this privately I'll have it publicly philosophy regarded in the light in which we have placed it as the striving of man's reason to comprehend the great problem of the world within and the world without to probe their real nature and assign their true origin that's just in quotes by the way in parentheses like just keep in mind has often met with no little opposition and even contempt as being either in nature of things an impossibility or if not impossible yet at least altogether fruitless it may be proper therefore to notice the principal forms in which one or the other of these objections have been brought forward and to weigh their validity i or maybe that just says no that's one it has often been urged that our possible knowledge is confined to phenomena which come to us primarily through the senses arranged and modified at the case may be subsequent reflection that all we have to do accordingly is to investigate and interpret nature that this has acknowledgedly led that sounds like a weird word this has acknowledgedly led and may still lead us to splendid results but that when we step beyond the observance and classification of sensible phenomenon so far from getting any deeper results we are going away from the beat of human knowledge altogether into absolute darkness and uncertainty let's talk about that a little further this objection was practically exhibited in the spirit of the french encyclopedia in the last century in the present century it has been reiterated by advocates of the positive philosophy interesting so that kind of starts to explore the idea of like darkness and lightness so lightness is knowledge true gaining and then remember i was talking about the the knowledge of the darkness and the seeking of it out well according to this but that when we step beyond the observance and classification of splendid phenomena so far are we from getting at any deeper results we are going away from the beat of human knowledge altogether into absolute darkness and uncertainty to this however the metaphysic metaphysician replies that however correct such a view of things may seem to the mere naturists or naturalists yet it is impossible for a human reason as a whole abruptly to stop at the limits of mere observation and rest satisfied with the results it affords without striving or desiring to advance beyond them and if it be asked why is it <clears throat> impossible for us to rest satisfied when the mind has done its best in making observations and classifying them there are many reasons that one <clears throat> that once presents themselves in reply first how do we know our observations are correct what is the grounds of our confidence in our own sensation are we quite certain that the re representation of external things within our own minds is it a cor is it a correct delineation of the truth of things which out without of many of our sensations we've become convinced by a very little reflection that they cannot possibly have any external reality answered to them colors for example arise from the separation of rays of light and sounds are produced by pulsations of the air but will anyone assert that anything external exists at a similar to impressions of colors or sound which we experience within where again is the outward reality to which the inward sensations of bitter and sweet correctively answer it is true that such sensations may prove to us the existence of some powers of nature out of ourselves but it is equally true that what we perceive is simply our own relation to these powers that all we can directly observe in each case is our own subjective state and that whatever these arrangements of nature may be in themselves separate from our own feelings they are to us wholly unknown and if it is to be the case with some of our sensations why it might be argued may it not be so with all if for example i see an external object what do i perceive directly but my own subjective state 
And where is the proof that this subjective state is perfect exemplar or pattern of the outward reality? Is there any grounds of certainty on this point, or is there not? In either case, philosophy is necessary, on one hand, to show the ground of the certainty, if there be any, on the other, to prove to us that there is none, and thus to fix the limits of the human knowledge, and show where we must begin to rest upon a simple and undemonstrationable belief. But the metaphysician goes a step further in his reply. Your outward observers, he says, it is true, collect together many facts of a diversified and interesting character, and deduce many empirical laws, but what is the nature of this knowledge? You know, after all, only passing phenomena, objects that are even, that are ever liable to change. The knowledge of single things, and mere empirical laws, however great in extent, is no real knowledge at all. For they may all pass away or alter their relation. And then what was knowledge become error? I want to know if there is not such a thing as absolute knowledge. Whether there is not truth that must be ever and unchangeably truth. Whether there is not immutable basis behind all this multiplicities. Some of these words I've not heard in my lifetime. Of contingent phenomenon. Whether I cannot find something that is necessary in which we serve as a foundation, on which to erect a system of real and unalterable science. If there be such absolute truth, it must be elicited by philosophical thinking. If there be not, philosophy is equally necessary to convince me that I can have no knowledge beyond what is contingent. That is, that I can have no knowledge which may not at all some... That doesn't make much... Okay. That is that I can have no knowledge which may not at some future time be error and delusion. So far the metaphysician answers the objection of mere outward observer, even upon his own principle, that all our possible knowledge is confined to the perception and subsequent classification of phenomena. But now, after having shown that, even in that case, there is need of employing speculative philosophy in order to investigate the validity of these phenomena. He comes to the principle itself and asks, Is it veritably a true one? Is there really no other source of ideas beyond sensations, modified as they may be by subsequent reflection? In other words, is there no other source besides experience? Interesting, right? Should anyone assert this? Then we ask, what is experience? Experience cannot result from mere isolated perceptions. For in that case, the consciousness of one moment could have no reference to that of another. In all experience, a subject is implied as well as an object. The multiplicity of our perceptions is all referred to one individual mind, by which the whole inference they convey is gathered up, and which remains ever essentially the same. Although it may be subject to any infinitely, or an, yeah, and infinitely of changes, whence then does this notion of self arise? How does the first idea of it come to us? Not from experience, for we have just seen that it virtually exists before the experience is possible. It must arise. Therefore, for some prior sources, and if so, furnishes us at least with one idea for the matter which we are not indebted to our sensational faculty. And if the fact of experience points us to some idea previously existent in the mind, so likewise equally does the whole phenomenon of thought or reflection. There is a unity in thought. If we search our own consciousness, we find that however varied though it might be, however many rays it may send forth in all directions, yet they are all conceived from one point, all emanating from a thinking self, which is externally the same undivided and indivisible being. But whence comes the notion of this unity which we term self? Not from mere reflection, for all reflection supposes it. We are obliged, therefore, to look about for some other origin of ideas until this matter shall be cleared up. And it cannot be cleared up without the application of philosophy. They're like, what the fuck is self? But if the objector is not satisfied with the 
refutation, refutation of its principle, the metaphysician goes on to adduce other ideas, and those of little practical moment, which he feels equally inclined to remove from the whole province of sensible phenomena, however much they may be refined or generalized by after reflection. Whence, for example, comes the notion of right and wrong. Twist them about and you, as you will, and tell me by which of the five senses the first elements of these notions come into the mind. If they indeed do come from reflection upon outward phenomena, it can only be from the observation that one course of conduct produces painful effects and of another of pleasing ones. That right and wrong, therefore, are other terms for useful and injurious. That virtue is another name for utility, justice for convenience, and conscious a balancing of advantage, advantage and disadvantage. A grave conclusion assuredly, and one that lies at the foundation of our practical life, one, therefore, which we ought not very readily to admit, unless it be proved on very clear and philosophical grounds. <coughs> Fourth, then, with your philosophy to give us satisfaction, once again arises the notion of... <laughs> What is that word? Oh, causation. I thought it was an E. If we appeal to our senses, we can see, it is true, that one action uniformly follows another, and that one set of circumstances uniformly follows another set, as far as at least our own experience goes. But if that is a sufficient account of our notion of causation, what right have we to take for granted that a cause exists at all in the case where our senses give us no assistance, and which lies beyond the beat of our own personal experience. Like, what is cause that is not outside of us? What is cause that is not of our own experiences? Is there a natural cause? What then becomes the great argument from final cause, on which mainly rests our confidence in being of a god? Why should we infer the existence of a supreme power, the creator and sustainer of all things, if the idea of causation contains no notion of power whatever, and is made to rest simply on the faith of what we experience through the medium of sense alone. The objection, accordingly, which is thus urged against philosophical investigation, may, if pushes to its full extent, become fatal to the groundwork both of morality and religion. At any rate, the duty lies upon the, objection, the objector to show that it is not so. In order to show that, he must enter into metaphysical discussion with the whole question involves. We might adduce many other ideas, such as those of space, of time, of substance, of infinity, as well as some of the primary conceptions of mathematical truth, all of which carry with them the same appearance of belonging to a class of notions quite beyond the region of mere phenomena. Those, however, which we have already mentioned may su be sufficient for our present purpose. But, lastly, the advocate of plain common sense says to the philosopher, You know better off than we, after all, for you too are obliged to fall back upon faith in the end, and are equally unable with ourselves to give demonstration for everything you have to hold true. Assuredly, is, is the reply, Certain ultimate truths there must be from which all reasoning takes its rise. But the question is, which are ultimate truths and which are not? We all try to find demonstration as far as it is possible to do so. And as soon as it falls on us, it fails us, we begin to assure, we begin to assume first principles and trust to the authority of some primary belief. We have a thing that we go back to when shit goes wrong. But the great point to be decided is, where are we fit to fix the proper boundary between the two? Where does demonstration really terminate and the legitimate re region of faith begin? The child trusts to faith for almost everything. As the reason strengthens and becomes more active, our childhood beliefs begin to give way to knowledge emitted on its proper evidence. And just in proportion to the vigorous of our understanding, we may move backwards the landmark between demonstration and faith, and include in the former what before lay in the providence of the latter. The metaphysician understands the demonstration of everything that the man of mere physical investigation holds true, 
but he wants to move the boundary a little further back to see whether he cannot demonstrate what is usually taken for granted. And if he cannot demonstrate it, yet he will at least know what can be considered as proved and what must be taken simply on the ground of its being a primary belief. Thousand to one, says Lessing, the goal of your philosophy will be the spot where you became weary of thinking any further. Yeah, no shit. A remark which should, ca should caution us not to be too hasty in our interdicting any branch of investigation and in transcending our faculties and not to fix the boundaries of, de of demonstrative knowledge without any sufficient ground. Give me a minute to like fucking... <sighs> Holy Christmas Kringle, but... That's the first reading of it, and like, to me, what I what I grasp from that, <clears throat> clearly we seek to understand what is and what isn't, and then we found ways to kind of div divvy it up and say like, oh, you know, reality is a thing, and like, but, but what is reality? What isn't reality? What do we have within our senses? Our senses, like when they grasp the situation, what, what is without those senses when it's a, away from our senses? Does it have the same bearing with what I feel, see, touch, and, you know, hear? Does that have any bearing on when it doesn't happen near me and shit like that? I mean, there's a great questions to ask oneself and, and exploring the idea of that. But at the same time, like, what was it saying here? Um, like, um, well, the, the common sense thing was, uh, was its whole other shit. It's almost hard to wrap your head around this. So, like, phenomena is what happens without you. But what is experience? It's, it cannot simply result from isolated perceptions. For in that case, the consciousness of one moment could have no reference to that of another. Like, what is experience? What is consciousness? I mean, it's exploring great things here. But, like, what can we take from that, that reading of just section one of the introduction? What can we take from that? Well, it's like, don't look to, don't, like, find hard, rigid lines to conform things into. That's kind of what I just took from it, as it's warning in the end there. But I definitely will have to, like, dwell upon this for a little bit and see what I can come up with mentally real quick before I end it. So it goes, phenomena is a thing as they seem. So phenomena, that's just how it seems. But from that point we have reflection, which reflection is part of our own, like, um, oh my God, big words right now, our own subjective lives, the reflections. But those reflections are different because each reflection is different from another one. They're not all the same. So from which of that point, what are they? And then that's when you have the idea of systems of philosophy for this reason and say, okay, yeah, principles and causes. And then from those principles and causes, like what are the things that created the situation to happen and what are the causes that, you know, came forth from that. But from that point, it seems as though we have something in our minds, like again, our subjectivity and our memory is all separate from these situations. So how can one understand something altogether with your mind reflecting on each moment of time happening? Now, that from that point, it's like, okay, things are not just absolute, truly. And then we have this line where it's like, well, then the absolute truth is outside of human understanding, is that where faith comes in. And then from that point, it's like, then we start talking about experience. What is experience? It cannot result from mere isolated pre preceptions, for in that case, the consciousness of one moment could have no reference to that of another. If experience is subject is implied, as well as an object, the multiplicity of our perceptions is all referred to one individual mind. Jesus Christ. And then from that, okay, check the camera life, we start to talk about, well, then what is God? What becomes a great argument from the final causes? So, like, what is causation? What is, what, when's the, uh, comes from causation? If we appear to our senses, we can see, it is true, that one action uniformly follows another. So, shit happens after one after another. 
as far as at least our own experiences goes. But if that is sufficient account of our notion of causation, what right do we have to take for granted that a cause exists at all in the case where our senses give us no assistance? When things happen one after another outside of our senses, we, we question whether that's real or not. And that because it comes out of our own personal experience of ourselves. And is that where the being of God lies? And having the confidence inside of that point? Is that a small medium alone to have in which you would you believe that? So what faith inquires upon the mind? Is that what is what outside of what we cannot explain? Is that the point of which we stop or is there a point of going further? And if there is a point of going further, it sounds like it says, don't put it in a box. And that's what I got out of that fucking first part. But holy shit, isn't that like... Oh my god, that's a nightmare. What am I doing to myself? Let's have a series about something that gives you a headache. <sighs> but yeah. So we'll continue this little series of um, the philosophy of the uh, 19th century. As according to this writer here. And again, the book... Oh shit. This, I have a very old version of it. And it needs to get worked on because it's like crappy. A historical and critical view of the speculative philosophy of Europe in the 19th century by J.D. Morell, I assume, M-O-R-E-L-L. -L. Then it says A-M. I don't know what that means. This is only the first volume, and this is the second edition, which is enlarged. Thank you, because I like when the words are a little bit bigger to read. But we're going to seek to understand what philosophy is from the 19th, and then maybe we can transition to the 20th, but I'd love to kind of go back further than that as well. And again, the reason that I want to kind of venture into this subject is it's going to play a very big part in the way I understand what happens in our book. Within the book, the idea that's explored through philosophy I kind of want to echo and I want to study and make sure that I'm up to date and that's this is not up to date but you know what I mean like there's something about modern philosophy that I don't want to touch so I'm not going to go near that I'm going to just take it from the past the idea behind that is to stay honest with the moment in time I would love to get to 18th century 17th 16th century philosophies just to see where it branched from Again, the real purpose I don't truly know, but the purpose in which I give myself is I'm searching for something. And I don't know exactly what it is, but all I know is when I get closer to it are some of the answers starting to come together in my mind. So, okay, well, fuck, let's go. Let's see what we can discover within this philosophical reading. Let's see how much we can expand ourselves to maybe what we already know. And not only that, like even in a small way, just with the language in which it, it was written. I mean, that was, I don't talk that way. You know what I mean? So it's, the language is a little tough, but through that language, that's the barrier. And it's almost like we'd have to fucking break down segment by segment. And maybe I'll get more into it when we do, when we get out of the introduction and into the proper um, chapters, as it were. That's when maybe we'll start breaking it down a little bit more. If there's some linguistical fucking issues, like, well, we don't say that. Or, like, that's a weird way to talk and blah, blah, blah. We can definitely get into that. But let's just kind of see what happens with this, uh, with this reading. All one of you watching this, which is me. 